Mean arterial pressure generates the, pre the driving force necessary to drive blood through the capillaries affecting perfusion. The mean arterial pressure generates a pressure gradient where the pressure gradient is highest as the blood enters the capillaries from the arterioles, that pressure gradient is highest uh, as we are nearest to the heart. And if you'll recall, um, because of the flow, we get progressively lower in pressure as we move through the circulatory system. And so pressure in the ar a arterioles is going to be higher than pressures in the venules as it picks things up. This says arteries and veins. I'm going to do a quick change and say arterioles and venules uh, just to make it clear that we're dealing with some very small vessels here and so because pressure one is closer to the heart there's more pressure here the farther away from the heart we get the less pressure we have if we were to look at a capillary bed what we end up having is the greatest pressure um, moving and decreasing slightly as we move through the circulatory system so as we continue to flow through the capillary beds moving in this direction that pressure is dropping steadily so pressure here at this exact point would be different would be higher than pressure here which would be higher than pressure here and higher than pressure here and so forth and so that's going to control the movement of blood through the capillary tissues and that affects exchange the capillary tissues are the only place where we can exchange um, gas and nutrients and fluid with the interstitial fluid. So out here is my interstitial fluid. And then of course we have my cells. So if we were to consider, you know, let's say this is my cell membrane, this would be my intracellular fluid. And if I want to get, let's say, glucose to my intracellular fluid, it's going to have to move out of my capillaries into my interstitial fluid first, and from my interstitial fluid into my intracellular fluid before we can use that molecule. So what actually drives substances into the interstitial fluid? Um, well, there's two things that allow it. The first thing to remember, and we've discussed this earlier in the capillary sections, but this is super important. If we look at the capillaries, those capillaries are porous, meaning they, they leak. They allow substances into and out of the capillaries. Now, only small molecules, small, 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 small soluble molecules. Um, and that includes water, that includes your sodium, that includes your glucose, that includes, you know, amino acids. Small stuff, though. Relatively small stuff. The big stuff doesn't get to move through those pores. And remember we talked about uh, the difference between your standard capillary and your fenestrated capillary. Fenestrated capillaries are what we see in this, the renal system, and, and the pores in the fenestrated capillaries are much bigger. They're more leaky. The soluble proteins have to stay. So if I have a protein like albumin in my circulatory system, it's going to stay in there. It's not going to move into the interstitial fluid. But oxygen will. Oxygen doesn't need to go through the pores. By the way, it can go right directionally through the, um, the capillary wall, the cells. Carbon dioxide will move, of course. Nitrogen to gas will move. Um, you know, amino acids will get moved, but not albumin. It's too big. Not, not albumin, not fibrinogen, not um, immunoglobins. Um, immunoglobins can get into the interstitial fluid. That's usually what happens, uh, one of the things that happens when histamine makes those capillaries more leaky is it can allow those antibodies to get into the interstitial fluid so those can sometimes move uh, but the other proteins don't they don't get into the interstitial fluid at all and this becomes important when it comes to generating what we call colloidal osmotic pressure now what is colloidal osmotic pressure well if we consider the fact that in here um, what we have is my albumin molecules in here um, you know my Oh, fibrinogen, my proteins from the uh, coagulation cascade, um, and so forth, these are all trapped inside that capillary.
but out here in the interstitial fluid we don't have those soluble proteins we do have extracellular matrix but those are not soluble they're not dissolved in water and so they don't generate osmotic pressure um, only the soluble proteins do so we don't have as much protein in the interstitial fluid compared or soluble protein compared to the high amount of protein relatively speaking in the uh, plasma now that high amount of protein is very very relevant because there's two different forces that are going to affect the movement of fluid in the capillaries the first force is the hydrostatic pressure so our hydrostatic pressure which I'm going to abbreviate pH remember this is the pressure of the blood pushing against the walls of the capillaries and the hydrostatic pressure is created by two things um, one simply the molecular size and how squished those are together, how compact they are. Etc. of the water molecules. So the more volume we try to force into a blood vessel, the more pressure hydrostatic we pr create. But the other thing to remember and and that's, you know, that's just the nature of any kind of liquid, but the other thing in the circulatory system is is essentially the heart, the systolic pressure or the blood pressure or in this case the mean arterial pressure gives me an additional pressure that pushes against the walls of the blood vessel and so that has a tendency to encourage water and anything dissolved in water to move out of my leaky capillaries into the ISF and we call that filtration when substances move out of the plasma into the interstitial fluid we refer to that as filtration um, and if that were the only pressure that we had to deal with, then eventually all of the fluid in the plasma would end up in the interstitial fluid. And obviously that's bad news. We don't want to do that. Um, certainly we need fluid to stay in the blood. And so we have to have a force to counteract my hydrostatic pressure, and indeed we do. And the force that counteracts the hydrostatic pressure is my colloidal oncotic pressure. So because I have if I look at the contents of the plasma and the contents of the interstitial fluid, the osmolarity of the plasma is exactly the same as the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid with some exceptions. Because there's protein in the plasma, the osmolarity of the plasma is a little bit higher. Not a lot higher, but a little bit higher due to plasma proteins. Everything else is the same. If I compare my concentration of sodium in the plasma versus the interstitial fluid, it's exactly the same. If I compare my concentration of potassium, it's exactly the same. It's just the plasma proteins that are different, but those plasma proteins create a slight osmotic draw, and that actually counteracts the, inter, or the hydrostatic pressure. Um, and that it draws fluid in. And the symbol we use for oncotic or colloidal osmotic pressure is this P pi symbol. By the way, colloidal oncotic osmotic pressure and then oncotic pressure. Um, why am I writing it down when it's spelled right over here? I don't know because I'm tired. Oncotic pressure here um, or colloidal, colloidal oncotic osmotic pressure written here. They mean the same thing and you can choose to use either term, it's fine. Um, or they basically mean the same thing. It's not quite exactly the same, and so I'm sure somebody who's smarter than me might call me out on that particular statement. But for my purposes, it's basically the same. Let's look at some values here. If we're in a capillary bed, if we look at the hydrostatic pressure on the side that is closest to um, the, H, the uh, heart, okay, well, the volume that I'm squishing into my little capillary is not really going to change much, but my pressure generated by my heart, this mean arterial pressure, does. And so the arterial pressure generated by mean arterial pressure at the side of the, heart, of the capillary bed that is closest to the heart is going to have a higher hydrostatic pressure. So in this example, we have 10 millimeters of mercury generated by that hydrostatic pressure um, by my pH.
Um, and then if we look at the hydrostatic pressure, let's go ahead and look at this. I'm sorry, let me correct myself. Uh, I don't want to start this video over, so sorry, you're just going to have to deal with the mistake. Um, anyway, so here's my correction. The total hydrostatic pressure is actually 35 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so the total hydrostatic pressure is 35 millimeters of mercury. But the pressure generated by the on, uh, colloidal osmotic pressure, if I were to highlight this, blood colloidal osmotic pressure is 25. So you're going to notice a difference. So if we do a little bit of math, if I take 35 millimeters of mercury from my hydrostatic pressure and subtract from that 25 millimeters of mercury from my colloidal oncotic pressure, osmotic pressure, then I have a total of 10 millimeters of mercury and that's a positive number so I'm going to put a plus sign there and that is essentially the driving force for the movement of fluid out of the capillaries. So the driving force for the movement of fluid out of the capillaries is that 10 millimeters of mercury. But now let's go all the way down here to the side that's closest to the veins. If I look at my hydrostatic pressure in this side, it's gone down. It's 18 millimeters of mercury. Now why is that? It has to do with distance and the simple reality that the farther away we are from the heart, the lower that hydrostatic pressure is because this mean arterial pressure here has less effect the farther we are. I mean, if you remember the veins, super, super low pressure systems. And so our venous end, not surprisingly, also a very low pressure system. But notice this. Um, does protein concentration change as you travel through the circulatory system? And I'm hoping you're saying no, because that is the correct answer. The proteins in the blood are created by the liver primarily, um, as well as some other um, systems, but, but mostly the liver. And uh, as that liver works as long as it has adequate supply of amino acids um, it's going to generate a set amount of protein and that's going to disperse and dissolve throughout the entire circulatory system and so my hydrostatic I mean my colloidal osmotic pressure stays constant so this value here is constant in the healthy individual even if you're not healthy let's say you're struggling with liver failure or uh, not you don't have enough protein in your diet you're still going to have a constant colloidal osmotic pressure. It just might be a little lower. So in this particular example, if this we assume is a healthy individual, the colloidal osmotic pressure is 25 millimeters to mercury, whether we're on the venous side or the arterial side, or even if we're just sitting here in the middle, right? Here's my colloidal osmotic pressure right in the middle. It's still 25. Anywhere I take a blood sample, it's going to be 25 millimeters of mercury in this example. But the change in the hydrostatic pressure is important. If I take my 18 millimeters of mercury of hydrostatic pressure and subtract from that my 25 millimeters of mercury, then I'm actually going to get a negative number and my negative value is 7 millimeters of mercury. So that represents my driving force for the movement of fluid and because it's negative, my fluid's not going to move out of my capillaries, it's going to move into my capillaries and so we get reabsorption. So net filtration on the side that is closest to the arterial end, net reabsorption on the side that's closest to the, vena, the venous end. This actually is perfect in terms of capillary beds because our job is to push um, water and, and nutrients and fluids and so forth into the interstitial fluid and then to collect waste, that carbon dioxide, the urea, the leftover water, um, and to bring it back into the tissue, or into the capillaries. And so we need this type of circular movement of water out of the capillaries, into the capillaries, because with it, it brings those dissolved particles that can be then, uh, that can bathe the cells, so that the cells can absorb what they need and use what they need. And so that's a, a really critical and important thing to remember. Uh, so here I basically walk you through the steps down here and, and I kind of spelled it all out for you here. So if you want to look at it here, we've got uh, right here, hydrostatic pressure pushes fluid into the interstitial fluid. Oncotic or colloidal osmotic pressure draws fluid back into the capillaries. Hydrostatic pressure changes. It's highest at the arterial end of the capillary bed. Oncotic pressure or colloidal osmotic pressure remains the same throughout the circulatory system. Those are important points to remember. And then we have this definition of net filtration pressure. 
This is essentially net filtration pressure. Net filtration pressure is the pressure that moves fluid out of my capillaries into the interstitial fluid. Net filtration pressure is high on the arterial end and it's a positive number and therefore it drives the filtration. But on the end closest to the veins, net filtration pressure is a negative number and it drives reabsorption. Now interestingly enough, reabsorption, we ab absorb less fluid than we filter out. And so we actually do get some fluid accumulation that occurs over time in my interstitial fluid. And that excess fluid will be returned to circulation through the lymph system. We always have these, these lymph capillaries that closely associate with our capillary beds. And the reason for that, there's a lot of reasons. One is to bring my um, immune system into close proximity to wherever viruses might escape the circulatory system. Um, or bacteria might escape the circulatory system, but the other is because the lymph system is actually going to absorb the leftover fluid. So the excess fluid uh, that is moved into the lymph system, and how, why excess fluid? If we come back up here to these numbers, minus 7 plus 10 gives me a leftover of 3 millimeters of mercury. It's a positive value, or so 10 minus 7. And that positive value means we have some fluid accumulating in the interstitial fluid. Um, so the lymph system grabs it up and returns it to the circulation in the subclavicle veins where the lymph system joins to the circulation. There are a few things that can affect this process. If we have elevated high blood pressure, what that does, if we go back up here, high blood pressure is going to change my capillary hydrostatic pressure. So if my capillary hydrostatic pressure is normally 35 millimeters of mercury, but my blood pressure is excessively high, maybe that's going to go up to 45 millimeters of mercury. The colloidal oncotic pressure is not going to change, so let's do the math. 45 minus 25 millimeters of mercury is going to give me a plus 20 instead of a plus 10. And so I'm going to be pushing even more fluid into the ISF. And then if we go down here, we still have to add 10 to this value, so instead of 18, I'm going to have 28 millimeters of mercury. And this should especially illustrate the problem because now if I uh, subtract 25 millimeters of mercury, uh, I have a positive value of plus 3 millimeters of mercury. So that means I don't get any reabsorption on this end, and instead I'm going to get more filtration. And so that's problematic because it means I don't absorb any of the fluid. It remains in the interstitial fluid. That's a little bit extreme. That would be really high blood pressure, but it does happen. And so if we have ex excess filtration, we end up with a buildup of fluid in the interstitial fluid. And that process is called edema. I'll show you that slide in a second. Conversely, if we have low plasma protein levels, we actually are going to see a redu reduction in, in reabsorption, and that does sometimes occur. Liver fail failure can cause it. So let me erase some of my scribbles so I can do some more scribbles. Yay! Um, <clears throat> so let's say my liver is, is just really struggling, and I'm in the midst of liver failure. Well, if that's the case, my liver is not going to be able to do a good job producing things like albumin or fibrinogen or any of the clotting factors or any of the um, complement system or any of the other proteins that are found in my blood and so my protein levels will fall so if I have a, a faulty liver maybe instead of 25 millimeters of mercury worth of um, colloidal osmotic pressure maybe I'm going to have 20 millimeters of mercury and so again now we can do the math if we assume 35 doesn't change so my blood pressure doesn't change if we make that assumption well now we're looking at 15 plus 15 millimeters of mercury so that's still going to give me more filtration than is normal and then let's go down to this other side now um, you know if we look at 25 millimeters of mercury as being normal but now we've got to subtract that 5 it's 20 millimeters of mercury and so now if we do you know 18 minus 20 uh, yeah, we still have a negative value, but it's not nearly as negative as minus 7. And so my re reabsorption happens, but it's just 
it's a lot less. There's less reabsorption. And of course, if this condition is more severe, if I have 15 instead of 20, you know, certainly that's a very severe situation because now I have a 20 millimeter of mercury worth of um, pressure here. And over here on this other side, 18 minus 15, now I'm going to have a positive value. And so my reabsorption is completely lost. And so these are factors that can affect my exchange of fluid between capillaries and tissues. And what happens then is edema. So if I have a situation where I have an accumulation of fluid in the interstitial fluid, uh, we get swelling. And quite often that swelling occurs in um, the extremities, so the feet, the hands, the legs. And um, what we see here in this example on the right is actually uh, edema due to malnutrition. In the absence of adequate proteins, your liver, even if your liver is functioning correctly, it can't make the correct plasma proteins. And so um, based on the size of this, this would be a child. And you can see by, by the indentation that remains when you press your thumbs into the, uh, you know, the feet of a child suffering from malnutrition and experiencing edema is that what you're doing with your thumb is you're pushing the blood back into the capillaries and into the lymph system. So in that little area there, you're removing the excess fluid, but the rest is remaining. And so you can tell that you've got edema. And so here are the causes, high blood pressure, high blood volume, because those are two linked, low oncotic pressure. And then the last one to talk about is infection. There is a parasite or parasites that can occupy the lymph system and create a blockage in the lymph system. And without that, without that lymph system, we can't collect the excess fluid. And so we're not going to return that to the circulation. So those are all the factors that affect uh, capillary exchange in the circulatory system.